Greetings, Earth scientists. We're going to learn about shorelines today, both erosional and depositional, and explain some of the features that you might see in the field as you travel. So if you're going to see an erosional coastline or shoreline, you will see well-developed cliffs. I was on a sabbatical this summer and see all these birds right here. This is a big uh, volcanic rock, and they're using that as habitat because it's a volcanic sea, uh, sea stack where it's been eroded by the water that you see behind it, which is the Pacific Ocean. So many of the erosional shoreline features you will actually see out in nature are pretty recently made rock. They're usually not very old rock. Some of the things you might see. A sea stack, just like you saw in the prior picture. You might see big, long, tall structures above an ocean area that would be called an uplifted marine terrace. Sometimes you'll see an area that's a cavernous opening in a rock where you'll get a blowhole, sea cliffs, sea caves, sea arches. All of these are features associated with erosional coastlines. Here's a great look at what sea uh, stacks looks like. There isn't a, is even a sea arch in the background. It's kind of hard to see back here, but these are uh, rocks that have been eroded by the pounding of wave action 24 seven. And so eventually sea arches will break into sea stacks. And so most, some of these were combined as sea arches at one time. This is actually a marine terrace that was I saw in Australia. This is in Sydney uh, Bay, it, right where uh, the opera house is. I took a boat tour there. And this is a big uh, marine terrace and really quite interesting. The city of Sydney sits elevated up pretty high on a fairly large marine terrace that's made out of sandstone. Sometimes a wave erosion will happen at different rates for different types of rock. That's called differential weathering. This is actually one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever been to. It's called uh, the Green Beach and Green Sand Beach, that is, at South Point on the Big Island of Hawaii. And it is very remote to get to. The grain actually comes from peridot, which is olivine, the mineral olivine which has to deal with the mafic rock. If you remember about learning in rock cycle about igneous rocks and the dark rocks that we have that are called mafic, that's an example there. So this is a small embayment area. It's cut out one section pretty well, but these have not, these layerings of lavas and ashes have not weathered as quickly. The more open uh, the area is to impact to wave action, the more likely it'll erode faster. So there's some depositional shoreline uh, features as well. Let's take a look at some of them. Of course, there's beaches. You might go, what's a spit? You're fixing to learn out, learn what that is. A bay barrier, a tombolo, which is one of my favorites, a barrier island in deltas. So uh, we're going to take a look at each of these fe features. You can just see this is a spit right here. This is where you get the beginnings of a barrier island. A barrier island is, or a bay barrier, is one that grows across the entire Bay region. A true barrier island is going to sit further out and have a lagoon behind it. This is a little bitty spit right here, but when you get a, uh, a spit that grows out and has some kind of rock that waves have wrapped around and deposited sediment behind it, that's called a tombolo. So let's look at some of these features and show them to you. This is a black sand beach in Hawaii as I was walking back from the green sand beach. This was uh, what I walked on. And beaches are not made by accident. They're made from whatever bedrock uh, hits is being hammered by the shoreline. This is almost exclusively black and green sand with just a little bit of carbonate fossil material or rubbish from living material that's recently died. I know that because the instructor I took a course, several courses from that uh, does work in Hawaii did beach sediment studies of Hawaii. And I uh, actually looked at the percentage of black sand, green, uh, peridot, ol olivine, white, which is the carbonate material, to determine the ages of the beach. This is a spit. I saw this in my travels this summer as I was traveling from the Redwood National Forest up into Oregon. It was a really uh, foggy morning, but if you look, you can see where deposition has occurred from longshore currents right here and we've almost got a full barrier 
uh, bay barrier situation, but it hasn't grown all the way across. Until it grows completely all the way across, do you have a bay barrier? But this is a classic spit. This is a classic tombolo. So you have uh, this rock acted as a barrier, and so the currents are going to hit this, wrap around the rock, and then deposit sediment behind it. A barrier island is where you get a formation of a long uh, stretch of spit material that actually hooks together and makes a lagoon behind it. Most of barrier islands around the world are fairly young uh, in geologic age, and most of them formed at the conclusion of the last ice age. Very common that we have them on the East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico. You, one you might be most familiar with is Padre Island. Barrier islands can produce interesting situations where on one side you have a beach and the other side you actually have marshland material. And that has to do with the side that's getting the ocean-derived currents and then the side that faces the lagoon, which is going to usually have more moisture. A barrier island can move landward over time and eventually join with the land. Uh, they can be associated with rising sea levels, and the oldest uh, deposits on the ocean beach will tell you the age of the island, and that'll be the dead marsh material that turns into peat, which is the beginnings of coal formation. Deltas are river sediments that get reworked uh, by waves as a river enters in a water body like an ocean, and it carries sediment into the ocean in the form of terrigenous material. This is a delta I saw in Olympic National Park. For those of you who are uh, fans of um, Twilight, I showed this to you, same picture to you in uh, a little earlier in one of our lectures. And this is actually where water is feeding into an ocean and making deltaic deposits here. This is in the same area where uh, Forks is located, if you guys are familiar with the city of Forks from the Twilight movies. Emerging shorelines are those that represent uh, terraces that are now above sea level that used to be a shoreline. There could be several reasons this would happen. One is sea level has uh, dropped, obviously. Another is isostatic rebound, where the ground has popped back into place. I can still think of a third reason. There's a couple of places like this in Alaska where um, in an earthquake that happened in 1964, a bunch of land got shoved upwards. And when it did, the beach uh, line deposits were moved up about 30 feet. And the new shoreline is making a deposition of a beach in its current location. So submerging shorelines tell us that these are shorelines that are currently below uh, sea level that used to be the shoreline. Essentially, they're drowned beaches that are now covered by water and they make dune-like topography like you see here in the Bahamas. What can cause these uh, sea level changes that can create submerged or exposed uh, elevated sea level uh, or sea um, marine terraces? It can be local tectonic processes like I mentioned with the Alaska earthquakes, um, isostatic rebound from where mountains have eroded down and the ground pops back into place. The same would be true with glaciers. We can also have a worldwide eustatic sea level change. Maybe that's from active mid-oceanic ridge activity like you see right here, or even glaciation changes at the North or South Pole. Eustatic sea level changes really are very closely associated with climate change. When we're looking at ice buildup, we're talking about glaciation in the form of massive continental ice packs and sea ice. In the last ice age, sea level dropped between three and 400 feet. 300 to 400 feet, that's incredible. So as sea level, uh, as the ice packs begin to melt, sea level will gradually rise. That's very significant because these areas in here are highly populated regions where people live. So there has to be a place to put those people after sea level rises over a period of time. Climate change and ch uh, changing sea level is a pretty hot topic. We have literally, uh, over the last 130 years, have risen a little over a degree Fahrenheit. We'll be talking more about climate change in our last lecture 
that's a scary thing because if sea level continues to rise by 10 to 15 centimeters, that's like a foot over the past 100 years, that's going to begin to flood people's homes out. So we will expect millions of people to be impacted by that long-term trend. Our U.S. coast have two different types of personalities. It's going to be based on the types of currents that come in, specifically the bedrock that's being impacted by the uh, wave action and the amount of tidal range that's in that area. Also, is it a passive or is it a um, active continental shelf? So let's take a look and see what those areas are. On our U.S. coast, we have some interesting situations where we have bedrock that's different throughout the United States. A lot of that's uh, dictated by prior transgressions and regressions. So if you look along this part of the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, and most, but not all, of the West Coast, you'll see that it's non-resistant sedimentary rock. That means it's going to break down pretty easily. You get a couple of patches of red here, a couple of red patches here, and a significant red patch right here. That's going to be highly resistant igneous or metamorphic rock. Down in this blue section right here, you have pretty sturdy, uh, hard sedimentary rock, usually in the form of dolomite or some kind of hard uh, sedimentary rock that doesn't weather very fast. So let's take a look at the Atlantic coast. Most of the coast are way uh, are, are just ready to be bombarded by wave action, and that's why we have a number of barrier islands common. The bedrock is completely variable from softer rocks to not so soft rocks, and literally we've seen that sea level rise by a foot in the Gulf of Mexico in the past uh, century. So we definitely have drowned river valleys that were present uh, in those areas from the last ice age. And the average rate of erosion of these rocks is literally 2.6 feet per year of bedrock. So along the Atlantic coast, you would expect to see barrier islands around here and in this section and drowned river valleys. The not so uh, soft rock, which would be the blue areas around Florida and up here in the New England states, you would expect to see different types of uh, situations occurring. The Gulf Coast has a low tidal range, has low wave energy, which is one of the reasons you don't see too many beaches of significant nature. We actually have subsidence happening in the area, so sea level is actually dropping. Um, if you have an area that's compacting a whole bunch of sediments from deltaic deposit, it may actually show that the sea level is rising a bit. The average rate of erosion in the Gulf Coast is six feet per year. So that would be this region in here. It's losing mass instead of gaining. The Pacific uh, Coast is extremely active uh, shelf. Right here you have a subduction zone. In this section you have the San Andreas Fault. The bedrock is typically not sedimentary uh, that are very resistant to erosion. And if you have sedimentary, um, they are uh, non-resistant. So they tend to erode pretty quickly. You'll have a lot of beaches along that area. If they're not that way, they may actually be igneous. And then you could actually have uh, lava where it would break down and make uh, interesting features like sea stacks, sea caves, especially from this area and right in this section right here. The average rate of erosion here is 0 0.016 feet per year, indicating the rocks are more durable. There are beach stabilization BMPs. As a test question, what does BMP stand for? Best Management Practice. These are structures that are built to decrease coastal erosion and help uh, with the interference of sand movement. They often result in unwanted outcomes. Unfortunately, we can't stop Mother Nature from doing her thing. So there's a couple of them that we're going to learn about. They're growings and growing fields and then jetties. And these are all best management practices you might see in a coastal area, breakwaters and seawalls. So let's take a peek. This is what a growing is. You might have called this a jetty in your past, but their growings are singular features, and there may be a number of them in a row along a beach line. And the idea is to stop beach drift from longshore currents. But you can see they need to come in and pull out some of the sand and move it back so this thing doesn't get destroyed. 
A jetty has two of these structures, like this one in, in uh, Oregon. I was in Newport, Oregon this summer, and I saw these this shot, and I was like, wow, look, there's a great jetty. And this is a jetty has, it's almost like a street that you built with a, uh, they're light growings, but they're two of them parallel to one another that allow uh, for no deposition of sediments in this harbor right here. Breakwaters are when you get structures like this, this, and this that help uh, reduce the potential for longshore currents and in some cases are actually installed in places like uh, Hilo, Hawaii to help um, offset the impacts of a tsunami. This is the Galveston seawall, and these are used to help uh, prevent erosion and actually also flooding in case of hurricanes and other wave-related action. Come back in just a little bit for a finale of oceanography, which is coral reefs. We'll see you in a little bit. Bye.